So really, this book is the culmination of me doing, uh, you know, the work myself on my own, my own daily drinking habit, on doing the thought work of trying to unravel my past as an adult child of an alcoholic, and and under embracing the science that, um, you know, that I I discovered that I started to to reeducate myself on, and not believing things like that I was genetically predetermined or genetically, you know, all of that. So this book is really the culmination of all that work. All right, let's kick it off. So welcome everybody. Today I'm here with Molly Watts. She is the author of her book, which I have here called Breaking the Bottle Legacy, How to Change Your Drinking Habits and Create a Peaceful Relationship with Alcohol. And I was just telling you before we hit record that um, this is one of those books where like in the first couple of pages, at least I, like I was hooked as the reader because you do, you're a really great writer, obviously. Um, but you also do such a good job of just making challenges with alcohol, super relatable and personal. So just want to thank you so much for being here. Thank with me. Thanks Katie. I'm so excited to be here and thank you. That's very kind praise. I appreciate it. And I'm glad that you're, I mean, I hope, you know, I hope the book, I, I hope the book reads in a way that is not just informational and educational, but yeah, that, you know, you get, there's some of the story there too. Yeah. It's, it's all of that. And I love that you call it a peaceful relationship with alcohol. Um, you know, a lot of my viewers on this channel are people who are on the Sinclair method or exploring alternatives to mm -hmm. AA, you know, for changing their drinking habits. And you talk a lot about that in here and really in an empowering way that demonstrates the the science behind how it is we have control over changing our drinking habits. So I guess I wanted to just start with like, where did this book come from? Like what inspired it? How did, how did it come about? Yeah. So, you know, my, my journey really starts back as a child um, because I was, I'm an adult child of an alcoholic. I grew up with my mother's addiction and it was, you know, I was 13 when she first told me that she realized she was an alcoholic and I share some of that story and, and really the, you know, but what became her story then also ironically became one of the biggest challenges in my own life. And that was realizing that despite how much I loathed how alcohol affected her and her relationship with it. And she, she went on to, you know, go to treatment four different times. Um, her last stint in rehab was at the age of 77 in a nine for a nine month in person program, which, you know, is almost unheard of. First of all, it's very rare that anyone seeks treatment at the age of 77. And, um, you know, she drank three weeks later. And obviously, at that point, the, the physical dependence isn't there after nine months, you know, it's, it's a psychological dependence. And her, I realized that, you know, she never, she never successfully uh, overcame her addiction. She died of it at, at, at just after, just before her 81st birthday. And so um, I say peaceful relationship because I, it took, it's that, understanding and appreciating and being able to embrace my mother's journey and our relationship is part of the work that I've done and part of understanding how my own drinking habits then manifested. And really that's what this book was about was understanding that while I had paid a lot of attention to my mom's problems, my own daily drinking habit was causing me a mountain of anxiety there, not to mention, you know, the health implications of it. Uh, and I, it took me a long time to feel like I had the power to, to affect that. I, I drew lines in the sand for many years. You know, I wasn't my mother because I wasn't, I, I, you know, I, I wasn't a binge drinker. I was a daily habit drinker and I didn't like the feeling of being altered. I was I had a lot of issue with that because of my relationship with my mom. And so it took me, but at the same time, <laughs> I, it was that one habit that I knew at the, at my core was something that was taking away from my life in exponential ways, mostly because of that anxiety. I, I lived in a constant fear state of, am I going to become an alcoholic like her? <laughs> 
And so really this book is the culmination of me doing, uh, you know, the work myself on my own, my own daily drinking habit on doing the thought work of trying to unravel my past as an adult child of an alcoholic and, and under embracing the science that, um, you know, that I, I discovered that I started to, to re-educate myself on and not believing things like that I was genetically predetermined or genetically, you know, all of that. So this book is really the culmination of all that work. Yeah, it really is. And it the way it's portrayed is just, you kind of take the reader on a, a journey and tying your mom and your own personal experience into it as a child of, a, of an alcoholic. I mean, I think a lot of people can relate to that. And especially how you speak so much to like, you, you didn't like what she was, but like, here you are kind of like living that same life and that fear of like, oh my gosh, am I going to become her? Especially when you're not equipped with the knowledge that, you know, it's not in our genes to become an alcoholic. It's not this lifelong disease that you're stuck with forever. Um, and so you just talked about, and you talked about in the book as well, the difference between physical addiction and psychological addiction. So can you tell us a bit about, I guess, I mean, we all kind of know what physical addiction is, but I think where you really like give this unique perspective is the psychological addiction and how, how that plays out and then how we are also in a sense empowered over that with the right tools and information. Yeah, yeah completely. And I know that's where you and I align so much because the, the, you know, the Sinclair method focuses on taking a drug, but it also focuses on doing the thought work. And that's really, you know, there is no <laughs> magic bullet to doing the thought work. You have to actually do it. And that's something that but for me, that was also very, very empowering because I think we're told by, you know, my mom was certainly told she was diseased. She was broken, you know, her, her whole, all many, most of the rehab programs are based on 12 steps from AA. Their, their, you know, their success rate is abysmal, but yet that's what we focus on. And it tells people that they are powerless over alcohol. And that simply isn't the case. It isn't true. And once we understand, for me, the understanding came from really understanding how my thoughts were directly creating the feelings that I have and also driving my desire to drink. And that by changing my thoughts up front, not so if in my, in my work, I call it the result cycle and it's your thoughts lead to your feelings lead to your actions, right? So many of us, when we're focusing on changing a habit, we get centered on the action part. So we're just trying to stop drinking, you know, we're trying to quit, you know, whatever it is, add exercise, stop overeating. You, you're focused on this part of the equation. And what I really came to understand is that I needed to back up all the way back to here to the thought. And what was really happening was that, that those thoughts that I had, simple thoughts, like, um, you know, I, I talk about in the book, one of those aha moments when I was first getting starting to do this work and first starting to change my relationship with alcohol, I got in my car after work and I sat down, I was ready to drive home on my commute. And the very first thought that came into my head was, oh, I need a beer. And that's like, it wasn't, I want a beer. It wasn't like, it was, I need a beer. And, you know, like intellectually, I knew that wasn't true. I didn't need a beer. I wanted one, but that was the thought that came. And so when we're doing this work, if we can step outside of ourselves and it's a, it's a unique human quality, being able to actually look outside of ourselves and view our own thoughts, that's called metacognition. It's not something that, you know, lower species can do, but our unique human brains can, and we can actually sit back and observe that thought. And what I realized was just that very thought that I need a beer, that thought fueled the desire to want, you know, to drink, right? And simply changing that thought, simply stepping back and looking at it going, wait a minute, I don't need a beer. I just want one. And actually, I don't really want one. That's kind of like that toddler brain, that impulse brain that's talking to me right now. What I really want is to feel relaxed after my long day at work. And I just have gotten into the habit of believing that alcohol is how I do that. And that isn't what I want for my long term. I have the ability to change this. 
And that's where the, the, the work kind of starts. And so the, the psychological dependence on alcohol is really just fueled by all of these thoughts that we've practiced over time, right? So if you constantly tell yourself that I need a drink to take the edge off after work every day, right? You continue, you don't question that thought. You just believe it. You think, oh, that's just absolutely true, right? It's just, that's, that's true. Instead of thinking, oh, wait, hold on. Actually, the science doesn't support that. The science says that if I drink more than and get to above a blood alcohol content of 0.55, I'm actually going to have increased anxiety after that drink wears off. And so retraining your thoughts, retraining your brain to see that every thought that comes out of it isn't just true. It's just a pattern that you've you've, you know, com you've committed over time and you've reaffirmed with your actions. That's how the process works. And so the psychological dependence comes from just, yeah, repeated use of, you know, repeated doing actions, following the thoughts that you have about alcohol. So well explained. And I love how you explain it in the book as well. And I think it so perfectly aligns for people who are using the Sinclair method too, because even though the medication is really effective at kind of reducing the craving for alcohol, we can still be in the habit of drinking. And a lot of people will be on the medication for months and be like, I'm still drinking every day, what's going on? But it's exactly what you're talking about because that thought is playing out and they're not perhaps taking a pause to take a step back and realize that I can actually change that thought. And we're not here to say that that's like a walk in the park and the easiest thing to do. It does take some conscious effort, but um it's totally possible. And that's where, you know, I really struggle. I know you talked about AA in your book about for me, like this, it hasn't caught up with the science. Like we're still using this archaic method to treat people. And it's the prominent way to treat people, but it's not supportive of what we know about neuroplasticity and habit change and everything that's been researched the last um, 50 years or more. So um, I really appreciate this perspective that you share. And I, I wonder, can you talk more about your own personal experience with um, the result cycle and you kind of implementing that in your life? And like, realistically, how hard was that? Or what did that look like on the day to day for, for you to like implement that number one, and then like start to see results from it? Yeah. So I'd say, so I always talk about the fact that when I started this, so I had kind of, I have two things in place. I have what I call my toolbox, which is kind of just a, you know, it, it, so if you take the, the result cycle, right? So that's the big part and then the toolbox. And so the toolbox is really just making a plan ahead of time. So in, a, in addition to doing all the thought work, when I first started this journey, I made a plan ahead of time. So I planned ahead for the drinks that I was gonna have. So I was using that adult brain, right? The logical prefrontal cortex. I wanted to not be drinking in the moment. I didn't wanna be responding to an urge. I wanted to plan ahead. And just that whole process of really training your brain to make a plan ahead of time and stick to that plan is a part of this, it was a part of my journey as well. So that's, so number one was, was just, and when I first started and I tell people this all the time, I met myself where I was at. I wasn't like, you know, <laughs> like trying to like immediately go from drinking three to four drinks every night down to no drinks or one drink or, you know what I mean? I started where I was at even though it felt uncomfortable to write down four drinks, I did it. And then I just started to slowly but surely cut back on that, cut back on that. Then I added alcohol free days into the week. You know, it was, but it took me, <clears throat> it took me about a year to actually just go from, you know, from where I was at to, to getting to the, the point where I was successfully meeting the low risk limits. And on a weekly basis, then it took me another, quite another bit of time before I was actually incorporating, you know, a, a longer alcohol free stretch. And then, in fact, 2020 was my first attempt at doing dryuary the first the full 31 days that I'd done. So, you know, it took me a long time to get to not a long time, but it took me time to get to where I was successfully always implementing and that part of the, the second part of that toolbox was what I call reflection and recovery. So I made a plan ahead of time for 
off plan drinking. And what that looked like to me was the fact that before I had, whenever I tried to change my drinking habits or, you know, go on a mini break or do whatever, you know, the way that we all do, right. I'm just going to stop for a week because that'll prove that I can do it. And then ultimately would somehow mess that up. Right. I would, I would take that, that stumble as proof that I just couldn't change this habit, that I just couldn't, you know, this was just just this was just the one habit and this discomfort was just what I was going to have to live with because being an adult child of an alcoholic too bad unfortunately I just like beer too much to ever give it up and I'm just going to be stuck with this endless loop of anxiety or whatever that's kind of the way I saw it every time I would would stumble I wouldn't I would take it as proof that I couldn't change instead when I was su successful at changing my relationship with alcohol I had a completely different opinion of that. And I took those stumbles and I really changed the way that I viewed it. I looked at it. I took the time to look back on what happened when I did stumble to see where my thoughts had gone off track. Was it just simple little permission giving thoughts like, like that, just, you know, oh, I deserve it or, oh, I've been so good or, or was it, oh, I didn't realize that I was really stressed out and I, and I just, you know, the, the minute that the, that I had planned for two drinks and that third drink was there. And instead of just sticking to my plan, I thought, oh, but I'm, you know, I'm so tired. I just really need it. You know, whatever it was, I took the time to look back and reflect on that with curiosity and compassion and really try to figure out what had happened, what thoughts were there and learn from it, you know? So it, uh, so that, like I said, it was, it was a process of understanding not only the toolbox, education and information. I talk about that. My, my third tool was education and information. And I was huge on that, really understanding the science of alcohol. That's kind of what I talk about in the book too, just realizing that the, how much it's not true, you know, like thinking that alcohol helps you, helps you sleep better. It's just, it's just not true. It's scientifically not true. And Yes, it can help you get to sleep, but unfortunately it disrupts everything else in your sleep patterns. So, you know, these are stories that we hold on to, stories that we tell ourselves, stories that drive that. And so it was a combination of all those things. I, I think that, you know, for me, it took longer because I was figuring it out kind of in pieces, you know, and hopefully that with, with, with my book and with the podcast that I do and with my group that I help people with, I'm hoping that I'm shortening that for that for other people because I've found tools that are very successful and now I can share them with other people. Yeah, that's so awesome. I wanted to ask you about um, the coping tool piece of it and like, you know, feeling emotions again and all of those things that come along with um, no longer using alcohol on a daily yeah. basis or however often. So what was that experience like for you? Because I see that be a, a really big hurdle for people where it's like, we really, and talking about thoughts, we really think we need it to cope with stress or we really need it to, you know, numb out from life's tough experience. And, you know, in my perspective now, that's just like a deception of alcohol. And like you talk about, you know, mm -hmm. what we're told to believe about alcohol. So what was that like for you kind of coming out of um, using alcohol in that way? And, and how did you navigate that? Yeah, well, I talk about that in the book too, because I think also for adult children and alcoholics, um, emotional immaturity is is one of the things that we learn um, a lot of the times from our parents. Because I know for my myself, for my mom, I can still envision her even as an adult, realizing now, she, you know, she just was she was very anxious all the time. She had a lot of anxiety, and obviously, she was thinking, you know, self-medicating in a way to try to get rid of that anxiety. And she just never viewed her emotions as something that she was capable of feeling, you know, I think she was scared of them. I, it, she wanted to avoid it. She didn't, she didn't embrace uh, discomfort. And I think that we are, we are kind of sold on this whole idea, especially through social media and all the, you know, the world around us that, that life's just, you know, that, that people are doing so much better, or they seem so much happier, they seem so much healthier than, uh, you know, than we are. And the truth is, is that everybody, literally everybody, 
um, you know, is going through something that you don't have anything that you don't know anything about, most likely, you know, and we, we are, it's, life is 50-50. And I believe that, I, I think that we're, we expect or we're not, we don't understand that we're really truly capable of handling our life, our emotions. And certainly for me, that was, again, realizing that these tools like this, the result cycle, the, the, the thoughts create our feelings, right? So when I'm feeling really down, when I'm feeling really, you know, discouraged, <clears throat> I, excuse me, I, I try to spend time looking at the thoughts that I'm having that are use again, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> driving that are driving that right so and really this is one of those those maybe it sounds you know woo woo mindsetty whatever but for me it was like okay really truly this is life like you can sit there and you can think to yourself and i just gave this example in my to to my listeners you know i could sit there and say to myself oh, i have a job that requires me to be physically on campus that i have to be there um i have to commute every day it's just you know, I want to go back to working remote. It's just, uh, right. Or I can choose to think, you know what, this is an opportunity to listen to podcasts. I get to build relationships with people on campus. I'm so lucky. I have a job that I like, you know, I mean, it's, and it's like, literally life is that simple. I mean, I know it sounds crazy at times, but literally our worlds, our lives, our journeys are that simple. It's where we choose to focus our attention, where we choose to tell the story, because the circumstance is that I have a job that requires me to be on campus, right? Period. How I, that's the circumstance. How I frame that, the story I tell, creates the feeling that I have. And if I wanna feel good, if I wanna feel better, I'm gonna choose thoughts that help me do that. Or I can certainly find thoughts that help me feel worse. Right. And, and doing thought work has allowed me to see so much of, of my life in a different way. Even my relationship with my mother, even my, that journey, I have been able to reframe that in a way that helps me feel better on a daily basis. And I always tell people, you know, if you're feeling great, if you then don't change anything, you know, don't go with it. But if you don't feel good and if you, if you find yourself struggling with overwhelm or anything else you know really take the time to to ask yourself what is it what is the story i'm telling myself here what is the thought that i keep looping back on is there a different version of this story what else could be true yeah it's so powerful to uh realize that we can change our thoughts and and our the stories we tell ourselves because as we know those really I, uh, create our identity. If like, you know, even just saying like, yeah, I'm an, I'm an adult child of an alcoholic. Like, yeah, that might be true, but like, how, how are you going to look at it and how can you use it as a, a learning experience? I guess. Um, I, I wanted to ask you before you started doing this work, did you have any sense that you were in control of your thoughts or <laughs> what was your life like with your thoughts back then? No, I think I felt like a, a lot of people that I felt like just things like feelings just happened to me. You know what I mean? Like I was just like, I'm stressed out. Like I just like the feeling came first. And I also just did not realize, didn't question my own thinking. You know what I mean? I, I, I joke around about it on in my group and stuff. I tell people, you know, I'm, I'm Hermione Granger. I was just, I'm a, I'm a lifelong know-it-all. And so I never, I never questioned my own thinking. So these thoughts would come in and I just believe them, right? I mean, it's just like, well, I thought it, so it must be true. And instead of taking the time to even question those thoughts, but to really sit back and go, okay, but what else is true? What else is there? Because I guarantee you that the version of the story that you're telling, there is another version. There is something out there that's a different in on the story that you're if there's a story that you're continually circling back on about your past or about your present circumstances whatever it is 
I guarantee you there's another story that helps you feel motivated, that helps you feel empowered, that helps you feel like you want to change as much as there's a story that want, that makes you want to feel discouraged and disappointed and, you know, sad about things. Yeah, absolutely. That's, it's such a new way to look at things because it's so easy, especially with alcohol, because I feel like alcohol just weakens us overall. It makes us, it made me like insecure. And I really believe that I needed it to cope with any life challenge. Um, and so for me, I really felt like it was, I was in this trap. And so um, and I think that's just like a side effect of when you're over consuming alcohol all the time yeah. too. Um, so well, yeah, it absolutely is. That's scientifically <laughs> proven. I mean, the more, the more you drink, the more that, that, uh, you know, that, that rebound effect that I was talking about that science, that brain science. So it, for those of you that aren't, you know, into neuroscience, the neurotransmitters, but your, your brain, when you when you drink alcohol, we all know alcohol is a chemical depressant, right? So it comes in, it acts as a depressant in the, in, to our neuro, neurotransmitters. There are other neurotransmitters in our brain that also act as depressant, depressant action, right? So it's slowing down the brain, it's turning the brain down. Well, our brains, because they're beautifully complex human, <laughs> you know, the most complex human computer in the world, uh, when they see this, this effect, this depressant effect happening, they think, oh, wait, I have an answer for this. I'm going to throw out all the neurotransmitters that turn the brain on that spike excite excitation in the brain, the, you know, and so there, when you, but it's not, it's not a perfect system, right? So you're taking in the alcohol, you're taking in the alcohol, it's, it's, it's compounding and the depressant effect is compounding and your brain is going, oh, wait, wait, I need to get back to homeostasis. I need to get back to balance. So it starts throwing out all these uh, excitatory neurotransmitters. It does it in a, you know, like a, like a bombardment. And so it's sending out a whole bunch of them. And so when this, the alcohol is dissipating from your system, you've got the brain still going like this. And so you feel this chasm between, right? The depressant action and this excitatory action. And you, that's why we feel, we, we talk about, anxiety and we talk about you know this you're getting extra sensitivity when you've got a when you've been drinking a lot your brain is basically saying oh shoot i need to to fire the brain up i need to be on alert i need to get you know you, you amped back up again and so it's it's a hard cycle to <laughs> um to get out of when you're stuck in it but once you do and you break that cycle out of there then you know and, and if you're only drinking one drink that that you know, that, that rebound effect is going to be minimal. Right. And that's, and that's really like about, like I said, blood alcohol content 0 0.055. That's the maximum positive effect of alcohol and anything after that. And pretty much all the negative side effects start to come into, into play. That's so interesting. And you explain the science, like you go pretty in depth in the book, but it's also <laughs> done in a really simple way so that like normal people that aren't super into neuroscience can understand it. So I appreciate that about it. Not everybody's, I know, I, I know that not everybody's is into neuroscience as I am, but I, for me, and I, you know, for people that like the, my podcast and like the book, what I found is that, you know, they learning that science for me was important because I, back to my roots of being kind of a know-it-all, I like the, I, I like the information and the information fuels my motivation to drink, to, to stick to low risk limits and to, to change my, it, it fueled my desire to change my relationship with alcohol. Yeah, because we can understand it even just on a basic level. And for me, understanding how habit change works, how the reward cycles function in the brain with yeah. alcohol use disorder, that was like a mind blower for me because I always felt like such a victim to my drinking problem. Like you described yeah. in your book, like oh, it's this label I've got to put on myself. It's my genetics. It's like, and I think a lot of people are coming at it from that perspective. Like, oh, there's nothing I can really do about it unless I want to go to AA, which is just like, I think keeping people stuck in the cycle even longer than they need to be. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm a big now I, my, I mean, my group, my podcast, everything is alcohol minimalist. One of the things I really am also dedicated to is making sure people really understand the the science and the low risk limits for alcohol um that's just 
it's it's not out there. In fact, I just shared, I think last week in my podcast about the statistics for the holidays and how many people, what they call seasonally binge alcohol and are completely unaware of the health risks and the safety risks of binge drinking. And so um, just, you know, I, I want people to understand whether or not they choose to have alcohol in their lives or not. Being alcohol free is certainly the safest option for people, but if they're going to include alcohol in their lives, they need to do it in the lowest risk way possible, in my opinion. And so that's where we're, 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 we're focused on being alcohol minimalist over with me. <laughs> I love the name. Yeah. But, um... In practice, I wanted to ask you, like, say someone's watching this today who is like really struggling and they, you know, they're maybe still in the mindset that like, this is my genetics and I'm disempowered. There's nothing I can do. Where would you recommend them to start with this type of work? Um, of course, you know, get your book. Cause it's, it's a short book. It's a quick read and it's, uh, packed with great information. Yeah. I, I mean, so I, again, I feel like people need to meet themselves where they're at. That's my first, my first, my first recommendation. Now I will just put in the caveat. And I, I think that this is important because I talked about this actually recently on the show too, after our conversation, there's a lot of science behind how, um, now talk, I'm going to not be able to say it again. Now track track. Home. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Every single time I talk to you, I'm like, what is it called, Katie? Naltrexone. Um, about how naltrexone really helps, especially with um, people who are binge drinkers, right? And so that's, I want to always caveat that. That wasn't my experience. I wasn't a binge drinker. I was a daily habit drinker. Um, still, according to uh, the the guidelines from the NIAAA, I would be, I would have been classified many times as binge drinking because ladies, just in case you're unclear, anything over three standard drinks in one setting is considered a binge for ladies. So, you know, even though I didn't see myself as a binge drinker by definition, I actually did binge and that, and then if you have uh, more than one of those a, a, in a month, any more than four drinks on any one occasion, you're actually then considered a heavy use drinker by the NIAAA not to mention on the weekly basis. So I, again, I talk a lot about these limits because it's important to me for people to understand. I think I was lulled into a false sense of security for many years, like it was no big deal, right? Because I was very um, conscious about not getting too altered or inebriated because I hated that with my mom. I sort of didn't, um, I didn't understand or didn't want to acknowledge how much anxiety just that daily drinking habit was causing me. Um, so I just want to just, I always like to caveat that for saying that for me, I wasn't a binge drinker. And so my work is focused on helping people that are typically habit drinkers. I do believe that people that are binge drinkers can have a peaceful relationship with alcohol. I do believe that they can include alcohol in their lives in a mindful way. But the biggest thing that I think is the challenge is not turning to it in excess, right? So it's that it's that wanting to over drink that has to be addressed. That is a little different than the work that that than the work I did. I wasn't typically wanting to quote unquote over drink. I was wanting to drink regularly. Still, again, over drinking has to be looked at for women as anything over three drinks. And I was over drinking if you look at it that way. But for me, I would drink, you know, I just wasn't drinking to the point where I felt completely, you know, I didn't black out. I wasn't, in, you know, those kind of things. I didn't have those experiences. So anyways, you, you asked me about, I, I got totally off on a sidetrack. No, it's, it's important. I'm glad you did. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. But for people that are just starting this journey, if they're they're you know, so definitely if they're, they're binge drinking, then I would say, you know, that's why, where I think TSM is super, super beneficial. And for exploring those options, I do believe that people that, that binge are going to have a, uh, they're going to need to really address why they're including alcohol in their lives, if ever, right? And that has to be a part of that equation. For the rest of us, for people that are just drinking more than they want to, drinking regularly and really needing to, um, you know, wanting to change that habit and get themselves into a more mindful state with alcohol, I think making a plan ahead of time for, for how they're going to include alcohol in their lives is super important. 
I think that being prepared for off plan drinking and knowing that it's going to happen and not looking at it as the end of the world or that it, you know, that it means that they can't change their relationship, being in it for the long run, just knowing that it may take some time, but that you have the power to figure this out, educating yourself on alcohol and the science of alcohol. Um, in my in my group, I have a recommended reading list. I'm a huge you know fan of both reading and podcasts for both for just to your point, not only for focusing on understanding alcohol better, but also just on habit change in general, right? And how we can impact our, our lives positively and making better and being consistent with our actions overall. And then lastly is find it, I say, find a tribe, you know, find people that you are, that are kind of in your personal life. It's very possible that not everybody around you is going to be making the same choice as you are with alcohol. <laughs> you know, it's very possible that other people around you are going to be drinking. There's other people, it's very possible that, you know, you, well, it's, it's quite possible that the world is never going to stop selling alcohol and that, you know, every event that you go to is, is it's going to be there. Right. And so finding people that are doing the work that you're doing or have the same similar mindsets as you do, or practicing, at least focusing on positive changes in their life is really important. Yeah. I love that advice. And I, I too, I think the community piece is so important. And I know for me, when I was first starting on this journey, I was like, I had a lot of shame and guilt in me. So I, I still felt very isolated as my alcohol use disorder was keeping me like very isolated. And so it was hard for me to kind of like reach out to people. And I was like, I'll just figure this out on my own. But I, I also think that that's a really important piece just to know you're not alone. Cause it, it feels like you're the only one going through this. And when you hear other people who have a really similar story, it's like, Oh, okay. Like I can, yeah. I can do this. Or especially people like you that have gone through it and come out the other side, you know, using these tools that are science-based. Well, you too. And I think that that's, you know, I hope that that's what my, that, I mean, I hope that that's what people find when they listen or they get involved with, with the things that I offer is just that, you know, to have hope because I, I was a 30 plus year daily drinker. So, you know, um, yeah. 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 It's really cool that you, and I guess like, as we wrap up, I'm curious, had you tried other ways before? I know in your book, you talk about AA and you were like, I can't, what was the example you use? You're like, I couldn't imagine going to AA just like I couldn't imagine what, running, running for president, running for yeah. president. I mean, yeah. I was like, yeah. There's no more, there was no chance that I was going to AA. Well, I mean, for me, AA was something that, you know, was just like, that was reserved for alcoholics like my mom. And I wasn't, I wasn't like her. And I, I held that, you know, I kept that vision of what having a real alcohol problem looked like as a way of not addressing my own, my own habit for years. Um, and really, no, I think that for me, I just, I never, uh, I started learning the, the, the result, the behavior map results log cycle that I talk in my, about in my work, I started doing that, learning that first. And I had been working on that for a few months. And then it was like one of those just, and I, I had another podcast and focused on building positive habits and the habits of a happier, longer life that I shared from my own experience with my father, who was kind of the antithesis of my mom in terms of how he approached life. And so, but this whole time I was focused on building these positive habits, right? There was this one little negative habit that I knew was there that I just truly didn't want to tackle because I, I had so many stories that I, like I said, so many stories that I told myself about my drinking habits that that I couldn't possibly, I was, I was just afraid to try it because I was afraid of what it would mean if I couldn't do it. And, you know, so that kept me stuck for a long time. But when I started learning this work, that's kind of was like, okay, well, I think if I'm, you know, really, <laughs> if I, if I'm really listening to myself, I really have to figure this out and I really want to see if I can. And so that's kind of where it started. So yeah, I hadn't really, I just had, a, had been really had become really good at ignoring it and believing that this, you know, successful career, successful family, success, you know, everything else was, was going great. Right. So I could just sort of ignore this one little negative habit that really kept me, that kept me stuck in a feeling of anxiety and, and worry. 
Yeah. And I, I appreciate that you talk about that because I think like you mentioned earlier, it's like, we don't know how good we can feel until we start to feel better. And just that <laughs> daily perpetual anxiety or mild hangover, mind fog that comes from drinking, that just becomes the norm. And then yeah. as you start to get out of that, you're like, whoa, I was really sick or I felt like crap every day and I didn't even know it. Yeah, exactly. And I don't, I mean, especially for people like me who are, you know, didn't, who just drink, you know, even two to three to four drinks every night, right? Trust me, folks. And I tell you that <laughs> you will feel differently when you don't do that anymore. Yeah, it's so true. Well, Molly, I, I want to thank you so much for being with me today. How can people find you, find your book, your podcast, your group, everything else you have going on on the interwebs? Yeah, well, easy, easy place is on my is on my website. And that's just www.mollywatts.com. It's Molly with a Y and Watts with an S. And that has links to my book, to the podcast, to the Facebook group, all of it. As you know, I'm just literally in the process of changing the name. So the book, the, the podcast has been called Breaking the Bottle Legacy because that's before I was launching the book. Um, and now I am changing that to be truly alcohol, the alcohol minimalist podcast, because that's really what we focus on. We focus on including alcohol in our lives in a minimal way and just changing our relationship with it overall and changing our daily drinking habits. So. Um, yeah, so I would love anybody to come to come check it out. Yeah, yeah, definitely go check it out. She has a Facebook group. I'm in there as well. So yeah, um, thanks so much, Molly. I'll uh, talk to you later. I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for having me and happy holidays. Happy holidays.